Hello everyone, my name is James Clark, and I'm here to talk to you about the mechanics of using a large two-handed sword. I would like to start off with some general guidelines for what exactly a large two-handed sword is, and what it absolutely is not. Now, regardless, regardless of whether you are training with a staff, or with a large two-handed sword itself, I want you to notice a couple of different things. While this staff is about an inch and a half longer than my greatsword here, you'll notice that on the staff, holding them one over the other, you can't really see where the hands go. Now, if I hold my hands very close together at the end of the staff, it doesn't matter what I do with my mechanics, cutting straight down, cutting diagonal, unterhalten, I'm going to hit the ground with every single one of my strikes. The reason being is because holding my hands this close together on a staff this size produces a 1 to 5 or 1 to 6 ratio. 1 to 5, 1 to 6 ratio? What exactly does that mean? Well, it means this. On this Albion Ringek and on this Arms and Armor Custom, you'll see that the Albion Ringek here has a blade ratio of about 1 to 3 and a half. This is means that about one piece of this blade, the, total, the totality of the sword, one piece of this is the hilt, and 3.7 pieces of it are the blade, divided into equal sized pieces depending on the hilt. This is about a 1 to 3 ratio, whereas one, third, one fourth of the overall blade is the hilt, and about three pieces of that are the blade itself. If I hold the staff in the middle, like so, you'll see that on either side, I can divide the staff into two parts. The staff is now divided into four parts. Three of those will count as blade, and the final, and the final third here will count as the hilt. With my hands this far apart, the staff this size, as I come down for my cuts, I am not hitting the ground. Coming vertically, the only times I would hit the ground are times I lean with the cut, times I lean with the cut again, times I pop the pommel, or times I pull it back, which also includes a pommel pop. Now, the closer the hands come together, the closer that is going to happen. Most two-handed swords are between a 1 to 3 and a 1 to 2 ratio for their hilt to blade. Most long swords are between a 3 and a half, a 1 to 3 and a half, and a 1 to 3, with some extreme cases going into 1 to 4. Now, the difference that this makes is pretty easily readily apparent. With this sword being held at a 1 to 3, my hands are quite close together. I can cut without hitting the ground. Pretty easily, not a problem. All of these cuts are lazy. With the 1 to 3 ratio, same thing as I deliver my cuts. I can keep my acceleration constant and my body turns with my cut. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that with the 1 to 3 ratio, my body is turning considerably more. This is not a function of trying to go to stop the cut. This is actually a function of the width of the grip. I want you to notice, as I hold my staff out with my hands close together, my point is very forward. The further my hands get apart, the further up that point gets. There are some great swords that, hitting the 1 to 2 ratio, have grips that are like 24, 25 inches long. They're not super common, but they do show up with a decent amount of frequency. With a super long grip, the body has to turn a substantial amount to keep the hands in front of the chest, and to drag that point through the opponent. If that point doesn't continue its rotation, if it doesn't go all the way through, your point gets stuck. If you try to reset it before that point, then you're going to end up jamming your blade, and with a sword this size, that bend is going to be huge, and you'll ruin your sword. As your hands get closer and closer together, bang! That's going to happen. That turn is going to require less and less and less. Bang. 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 
remembering to keep your body upright and not bending the left elbow. With your hands this close together, most of the artifacts that you get, you're not going to be able to train out because in remembering them, even pulling the pommel, I'm still going to hit the ground. It's something that I have to do a substantially huge twist of in order to miss. And at this point, my cut is so unstable that it doesn't matter if my trajectory is perfect. As soon as I hit any resistance, the whole thing is going to shake. Now, if you are practicing with a tool that, like this nine pound monstrosity, is quite heavy and has a large grip, you wanna make sure that your mechanics do not change. A very common thing to have happen with a tool of this size is that as you come down, rather than extending out and coming down as a function of the weight that's in front of your hands, what tends to happen is because it weighs so much, you bring your hands down and then you shoot and pivot at the same, at the same time. When you do something like this, it means that your hands are trying to stop the sword at the moment it's beginning acceleration and the moment you're beginning to add most of that power from your hip turn which means that the moment where you have the highest strength and the highest acceleration input into the blade also becomes the time you're trying to stop it, which is insane. You don't want to do that. It will lead to injuries very easily and very quickly. You want to make sure you get that extension towards wherever your target is, and then you continue to cut down. Pull and cut, pull and cut, pull and cut, pull and cut. This way your body continues to be what stops the sword, not your arms. You don't want to feel your arms as much as possible in that end of the cut because, well, you're going to have problems. With any sword, with any staff, this cut itself stops as a factor of the hips, not the arms. As I come down, I'm stopping with my turn, my arms are still straight, I'm just ending at the end of the cut, at the end of its arc. Now, likewise with the Unterhau. As my cut comes up with an Unterhau, if my hands are in that one to five, one to six ratio, regardless of what I do, that staff is going to come up and it's going to slash the ground. If you're using a regular longsword, there is a trap you can fall into. The closer that this longsword comes to your body, the more likely it's going to be when you begin to extend a cut that you're going to hit the ground. I hit the ground here well behind my foot. The blade on this sword is 36 and a half inches long and I'm six foot one feet, and I'm six foot one. I'm not a short person, but with a 36 inch blade, I can still drag behind my foot. Having done this before, you can see just how easy this is to do if you're trying to cut up at a super steep angle. You'll notice just how much of my blade is on my foot and raking across. The blade I normally cut with is actually one inch longer than this, 37 and a half inches, whereas this is 36 and a half. Now I'm going to go ahead and, since I know this from experience of how I cut the foot, I'm going to go ahead and splice a, splice a clip in from three years ago at Fexual New York where it happened. This way you can see the mechanic in action yourself. Cue clip now. All right, go ahead and watch the foot and watch the guard a little more carefully as I come down. Tuck, bang. Do you see that? Yeah, it's not very fun and it gets even worse. The size at which that can happen, it is a factor of the blade. However, it starts to happen at a blade that is very, very, very short. You'll notice with my foot hitting the ground here, clang. If I subtract another inch from this blade, I'd still be hitting my foot. Likewise, if I was just two or three inches shorter, a 34 inch sword will easily slash across my foot if I pull that Nebenhund into my body. So while it is a factor of blade length, the blade length where that begins to occur is very, very short. Now, with a two-handed sword, you don't necessarily have to pull your hands up before you even pop your blade out. In some forms, such as just uh, Francesco Alfieri, you will see forms that start about right here. The blade's about the size of the wielder itself, so it's about this tall. 
His pommel is just above his head and his point is very forward, at which point he begins his cut. Crack with his stuff. This is because his mandriti and sodamani occur along the fendenti lines. They are almost completely vertical. In order to get that shot, the blade, even with the long sword, you'll notice if I try to do a vertical cut along the fendenti line with this, I also have to bring my sword out in front of me, but because the ratio of the, of the hilt to blade is lower, my hands can start lower. Pop. And everything else is a factor of hip twist. Because of that blade ratio, as I come down from neighborhood and I come forward, I can get to here before that point, before snapping my fingers, and before continuing my blade twist. And as I do this, my Unterhell is still quite steep. I don't have to bring my hands up to my head and then snap forward. My hands come forward. I see the chest of my opponent. I see where my hands are. I see where my blade is. My blade is already at a function of its extension. And it continues the rest of the way forward. The blade itself doesn't have to be steep because the hilt ratio allows me to do that. By having the ratio be one to three as opposed to one to five or one to six, I can get a regular Unterhal without a problem. You'll notice, however, at the end of my Unterhals, my body is very turned. This is also a function of the larger width of the grip. If my hands are one to six, the larger blade is going to continue to press, and if I don't continue to turn with that body, I'm going to detach it from my torso. Any time with either a long sword or a two-handed sword, well, which both mean the same thing, any time with a small two-handed sword and a large two-handed sword, if your hands pass your torso, you lose control of them. The axis of rotation does become your hands. It basically turns it almost into a dispositive action rather than an executive action. Rather than using your large muscles to feed and control the blade, you're relying solely on your arms. This is not something you want with any weapon in any KDF or Italian tradition, with the exception of a rapier. Consequently, a rapier also has about a 1 to 5 or 1 to 6 blade. But because the blade itself is relatively light and you don't want to bring your guard all the way down, it no longer becomes a problem in terms of hitting the ground. In Destreza, your pops will end in the posto erecta, and with blades that are more side sword size, your blade's not going to be long enough to actually hit the ground because that one to five ratio is a factor of the size of a one-handed grip, not a two-handed grip. The size of the grip does in fact matter. Now, the pivot when you're cutting over your lead leg is quite difficult. Your, your feet themselves have to change because otherwise you can't really turn over your lead leg. This is fine and it is an artifact of cutting over your lead. In most of the works that have the Unterhal with the large two-handed sword, such as Pornfeint, such as, Witt, well, hypothetically Wittenweiler, such as the Montanti and Sodomani in Alfieri, such as the Mandrito Redopio in Morozzo, it requires the hip turn. In Morozzo, he actually gets around this in a kind of cheeky way. In Morozzo, Whenever he does the mandrito redopio, he's ending in a guard known as Coda, ah, so Coda Lunga, Jesus. He's ending in a guard known as Guardia di Entrare, either in Largo Paso or non Largo Paso. But my blade doesn't go all the way up. Much like a Oberhal that ends with its point forward, this is a redopio cut that ends with the point forward as well. In threat, in threat. By ending in threat and not cutting all the way through your opponent, you're not requiring as great of a twist of the hip. In Alfieri, in Alfieri, however, he is going all the way up and he is continuing his motion to come around for a second one because fighting spears is scary. Now, as you get into larger and progressively larger weapons that cut, such as hewing spears like partisans, speedums, halberds, glaives, the mechanic itself is the same, but the function of which changes. Since the staff's a little short for this, but since your staff is going to be about as high as a man can reach, about seven feet, maybe eight feet, depending on how tall you are, ugh. 
If I have my grip as wide as it is held in, let's say, Yoki Meyer, in order to do the hip turn, I have to turn a ludicrous amount in order to get that cut off. Now, if I bend this arm, I completely lose my stability. So how do we find a balance between these two things? Well, in Yoki Meyer, he, he puts that bent arm into his chest, allowing it to function as a very stable axis of rotation. It's not going to bend because as soon as the shock hits and continues through, I have it braced against my body to continue its strike all the way through. Whether I'm cutting very, whether I'm cutting more vertical obliquely, whether I'm cutting more diagonal obliquely, and whether I'm cutting with a full horizontal strike, my body turns with it. And since my back arm for that stability is anchored into my torso, that doesn't become a problem. With a large two-handed sword, however, even if, let's say I've got a ludicrously sized grip by grabbing the ricasso up here, which I believe 16 and a half, about four. This puts me at about a 25, 26 inch grip. I cannot get that anchor. Any function of hyperextension that I do is going to draw the pommel into my armpit, and I'm going to lose all of my strength, and I'm going to hit the ground anyway. Most of the large two-handed swords that have the larger grips still have about the same blade size as the ones that you see in the Mediterranean. So whereas in Italy and Spain you'll find swords with 49 and a half inch blades that have 16 or 17 inch grips, in Germany and also somewhat in Italy and Spain, you will find swords that have, again, a 49 and a half inch blade, but also like a 22 or 23 inch grip. It's not uncommon. All that does is it brings the point higher and if your pers the person wielding your spadona is shorter, they can continue to turn. That was terrible. And why am I left-handed? You can continue your turn, and you can make it more through your target with the large two-handed sword if you are, in fact, shorter. I personally view this as something of a cheat because, as you can see, the, pump, the point extension being very high actually artificially reduces the amount of reach that you have. So I don't see a whole... The, uh, point in having a sword with a 49 inch blade if you've got a 23 or 24 inch hilt. At that point you should just come back down to a 1 to 3 and use a smaller blade. You get more reach and your point gets out there much faster than it would if you had a substantially huge grip. So one of the most common problems that you will find is that this sword, the great sword here that I'm using, the sharp, weighs about 5.8 pounds. This Albion ring gecko over here weighs about three pounds. If I bring this closer to the camera, flip it to the side so I can show you the distal taper, they are both eight millimeters thick. They both have a nice taper down to their cutting edge, but neither profile taper. Well, but the two-handed sword does not profile taper much. This causes a larger concentration of mass further out on the blade of the two-handed sword regardless of where my balance point is. If you haven't read or bought a copy of Peter Janssen's Das Schwert, I do highly recommend it. One of the things that he talks about is the concentration of mass along the blade. So whereas the balance point on this ringgeck is four inches and the balance point on that two-handed sword there is four and a half inches, where you feel that mass is extremely different. When you're accelerating a lever arm, if you've got the load further out and your fulcrum in the same place for both, the, sort, the lever that has the load further out is going to require a little bit more to accelerate and to continue move, to, to accelerate and continue moving. Likewise, a sword that has less of a mass further up the blade is going to require substantially less to accelerate and keep moving. The weight of that sword there is canon for the sword that I was copying. Like I said, it starts off eight millimeters thick. Likewise, the sword that I was replicating also starts off eight millimeters thick. Two-handed swords, the large ones in general, much like the small ones, have a huge diversity of how thick they are, how wide they are, how much they taper. There are quite a few swords that are 49, 50 inch blades that start off about four millimeters thick. The less wide that your, the less thick that your blade starts off, the less it'll weigh. The less wide it comes off, the less it'll weigh. And the larger the rakazo on the blade, the more of that concentration of mass will be by the hand and the more agile you'll make it feel. 
which is part of why so many two-handed swords had this ricazzo here. It doesn't produce as great an effect as it does on the super wide flaring that the long swords have, as it's not a constant effect. It doesn't get super wide as it continues to come down, it just immediately concentrates some of that mass right here. It's still a little bit further out, but it's not as far as it would be if the entire blade was profiled without a ricasso. This sword also has a pommel that isn't terribly large, so it has a little bit more of a fur fur fur. Fur fur fur. Fur fur fur. Fur 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 style of cutting. As soon as it begins to accelerate, any real problems that are present in my cutting structure, I will feel immediately. If it doesn't start off along the proper trajectory, it'll just continue to pull me down there. That's not something I can continue to correct. That's something that I can only go, well, I messed that up, time to try that again. With something like a staff, you can get a similar effect at even half the weight of the longsword itself. As long as your hands are in that one to three ratio, as you cut, even though it weighs less, there is no distal taper on this. There is no profile taper on this. The mass is very evenly distributed, and you're going to feel that need to accelerate, that ending position, and that trajectory very quickly and very easily, regardless of which cut you end up doing. It's something that's a factor of the blade, it's of the weapon itself, not necessarily, it's a factor of the blade itself and not necessarily the handling characteristics of every single weapon you use. One thing you will not get out of a staff is sword wind. And in order to train that, you'll have to practice with something, there we go. You'll have to practice with something that is actually either flat or something that has an edge or something that has fuller so that when it's aligned it creates a loud whistle. Acceleration, cutting, coming down, hitting the ground, cutting myself, ah. Now, many fetters that we use in our modern HEMA times have blades that are around 38 to 40 inches long. This is not uncommon historically. So, in 1480, Filippo Vadi does have a method of sizing a longsword to yourself. And what he says is that the height should be just under the armpit with the grip the size of your palm pinky to thumb with the hand fully extended, and the pommel the size of a balled up fist, and the rest is cross guard and blade coming straight down. Now, for me, this produces a sword with an incredibly large blade, partially because I'm tall and partially because my hands are not very large. It produces a blade with 40, that's about 45 inches long with a hilt that's about 11 inches long, which is pretty silly. Gerard Tybalt, however, says that the sizing of the espadon should be going up to the armpit and the blade length is still the same as the single sword coming up to your belly button here. What this does is rather interesting. One of the things that Gerard Tybalt says, let's see where 40 inches is on the staff. This is 47, that's their causa. So this will be about 40 inches. Zoop. And this will be about 44. With Gerard Tybalt's method of measuring a long sword to myself, as well as a rapier, the blade is 44 inches long if I'm not wearing shoes. What he says about this is that this method of sizing and proportioning a sword to yourself allows you to draw it from your hip. As you begin to bring that sword out, your foot lifts up and you're able to bring the sword completely out in front of you. As you get shorter, this will naturally decrease in size and that's what he calls his ideal length. There are shorter swords, there are larger swords. The larger swords, he says, are more of a factor of cowardice. He's not wrong. The large two-handed sword is to keep multiple assailants at bay, which is very much a, oh God, oh God, oh God, sort of thing. And he also says that in doing this, and he pictures this as well, by having your back arm recoiled and ready to strike, whether I'm bracing my opponent with my fist, or whether I'm bracing my opponent with my foot, I can stab forward with that ideal blade length. So whereas I can cut, keeping my mechanics very, very well with a large sword, I can cut with my mechanics doing very well with a small sword, as well as lighter, or heavier ones within that range. The ideal weapon for me would be something with a blade around 44 inches long, because that is still something 
so I can draw from the hip in the tradition of Gerard Tibble. Now you'll notice that with Tibble sizing with body sizing, body sizing on me producing a 45 inch blade and Tibble sizing on me producing a 44 inch blade, these two stats are separated by almost 200 years. The espadon in the time of Gerard Tibble was already beginning to kind of wane, whereas in the time of Vadi, it's hitting its heyday, as the Destreza masters would call it. Vadi's longsword, when he pictures it, when he's standing like this, the proportions of his weapon are very similar to what I've described before. 45 and then 11. It's just close to between a 1 to 3.5 and, and a 1 to 4, because it is an extreme size. Again, most likely because of the factor of my hand size. But, he also talks about differing methods of using it. He both talks about dueling with it, as well as stopping riots. He doesn't go into the detail of how to stop the riots, he just mentions that's something you can do as part of your civil duty with a large two-handed sword. Because of this, I see Vadi's longsword as kind of a transitional sword between what the Germans would call a Schlagschwerter and other kinds of longsword. Now, according to Andre Parnfein, the KDF system that he goes over, which includes both Lichtenauer and some of the Marx Bruder system, includes everything in the longsword range, which he names as the Schlagschwerter, Ritterschwert, Estoc, which is closer to what this is, and many other swords that I will not repeat here. Now, this sword isn't quite in the stock, but it's also not the Ritterschwert. If I wanted this sword to be a Ritterschwert, it would have to be much, much smaller. The whole purpose of a Ritterschwert is that it was something that you could ride around town in without it being a hassle to everyone around you, or walk around town in without it being a hassle to everyone around you. Whereas with the large two-handed sword, the Schlagschwerter, I have to keep it on my shoulder, or on my shoulder like this. When I draw it, I'll use this with the scabbard, when I draw it, and Domingo Luis Godinho, Luis Pacheco de Maravez, and Alfieri both talk about this, as my scabbard comes off, I basically just leave it in the street. I toss it, I go into guard, that's the end. A richer spirit can be drawn very quickly without having the scabbard get in the way in the fight. You don't have to discard it at all like you would for what many people say a longer longsword happens in the middle of a fight. And because of that, it makes it an ideal close combat weapon, at least in urban environments. Drawing this, I don't even have to lift my foot in the Tibalt style, and it's there. Because I'm tall, this might actually count as a Ritterschwert for me, although it still requires a little bit to draw. Now, if you're having students that wind bass they are cutting, are popping the elbow or drawing the elbow back, again, popping the elbow, there are a couple of different things that could be happening. The first is that in our everyday lives, we do not often use our hip flexors or hip adductors because we're sitting at a desk all day or just kind of meandering around town or driving. Because of that, these muscles aren't used to working and typically are quite tight. There are many, many stretches that you can do with your students in order to help make those muscles a little bit more flexible and easier to use, increases their proprioception, as well as there are many exercises that you can do in order to increase the actual pop that you get from those two muscle groups in order to increase that feeling of being able to turn the torso. Likewise, it's also a function of the tricep itself not wanting to extend, again, most likely because it's compensating for not wanting to turn the core. One thing that you can do for this is you can do exercises, snap, 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 that require a rapid, fast extension and a slow recall. That way the bicep isn't engaging as much, but the tricep is engaging as much as it can. And every time you shoot that tricep out, go ahead and give it a good tap. And that'll help tell your body, hey, this muscle exists. Hey, you're trying to use this muscle, wake up. And that will help take out a lot of those problems that you see when, they, when people cut poorly or poorly. Now if you've got someone, on the other hand, who's coming down and they're keeping this arm bent in order to try and compensate for not wanting to, for not wanting to hit the ground, that's both a factor of fear for thinking that they'll do this. Again, I apologize for the jump cut there. I have successfully talked a battery to death.
Now, if you've got a student who's bending the front arm as well as the back to try to halt the momentum of the sword, it's entirely possible that they have a very, very tight bicep. This can result from doing a lot of tra training for bodybuilding or generally trying to look good because the muscle for the bicep and the pec, they do connect along a similar chain, and because of that, they can stretch with the exact same stretch. Placing your hand on a wall, palm flat, fingers flat against, elbow also flat against the wall. You will turn your body perpendicular to the wall, stretching that muscle chain across. You should feel it in the joint, across into the pec. If you feel it in the pec, but not the bicep, it's because the pec is actually tighter. It'll take a little bit of stretching in order to actually get to your bicep. That's fine, that's just a function of how our muscles work. The bigger one, is good, or whichever one is tighter, is typically going to be the one that requires the stretch first. Once you feel it in the, in the bicep, it is going to be very, very obvious. If you have your hand too high, you're not going to hit the bicep as hard. The lower that arm goes, the easier it is to isolate the bicep over the pec itself. Now we've just gone over several exercises for both isolating our triceps to try to get that extension in order to help prevent hobble bending for both withdrawing a cut and hyperextending a cut. We've also gone over exercises for waking up our hip adductors and our hip flexors in order to help with getting that hip twitch to wake that muscle chain up. And now we've gone over stretches for how to, for how to increase the proprioception of the bicep and the pec so that you can actually get that full extension to go for your cut without it being too painful or requiring too much concentration or focus on your part. Now, any muscle that you exercise a tremendous amount is going to require stretching to stretch the hip flexors and it will also help increase proprioception. You can lean back in a way which will stretch the oblique and flexor chain coming up here. Pop, 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 pop. Likewise on the other side. Pop, 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 pop. You can also do this on the ground. Hands down, body out, drive one hip down, and look over the opposite shoulder. This will also help isolate that muscle chain in order to stretch the obliques and the hip flexors. Now, to stretch the tricep, it's an exercise many of us know and love. Hand goes behind the shoulder, pull, kind of lean away. It'll stretch the tricep chain down here, and also depending on your flexibility, a little bit of the hip flex, a little bit of the hip flexor and lats as well. These are all exercises you can do to diagnose yourself or your students if you begin to have trouble in cutting. This, well, cutting or really any form at all. This proprioception is very, very important. If you just train the sword itself without keeping your body on its toes, say maybe going to class once or twice a week, your body's going to have a hard time going, huh? Oh, it's time to use the hips again? Oh God, oh God, all right, and it's working now, it's working now. You need to be able to keep your body up and going even on days where you're not practicing. And doing these diagnostic exercises, shooting out and pulling back, or turning the hip, either without an without a elastic band or with an elastic band, if you're indoors and you've got a place to hook it to, all of these things will help keep those parts of your body awake and active. That way when you go and you use any weapon at all, you'll be able to feel those muscles and those muscles will do exactly what you want them to do because they're already awake, they've got the proprioception, and they've got the coordination. It's a martial, what we practice is a martial art and everything is a factor of coordination. If that coordination is not there, then the, cut it, then the cut or any form that you do is going to have its share of problems. And the coordination can only be built by constant practice and constant time. Likewise, you want to make sure that the tool that you're training with is the proper size, the proper proportions, and you want to alter back and forth between something long, something short, something heavy, and something light. All of these things will help increase your proprioception with a massive range of weapons. If you stay too much in one group, you're going to end up building the proprioception in one area, and as soon as you leave that, it's going to become somewhat awkward. Now, I've already talked earlier about the different kinds of fetters that we have and the different effects that they have, so I'm really not going to go into that again. I'm going to go ahead and end this talk here. If anything else comes up, I will go ahead and make a second video. In the meantime, 
This has been my presentation on the cutting and use of large two-handed swords and the staff as well. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy using these wonderful weapons.